interesting. Um, Point EDM, who is going to talk about uh, the experiment and future outlooks. Thanks so much, Skyler, for joining and actually actively participating along the workshop. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you for the invitation. I have to say I was really looking forward to being present for this workshop, and I'm sorry I can't be. Um, I have some unforeseen family-related obligations that are preventing me from traveling at the moment, but it's really been a pleasure to participate to the extent that the hybrid mode allows that. So as advertised, I am going to give you essentially updates and some highlights on the pan-EDM experiment, and then some additional thoughts on problems faced by the experimental community in which section I will not necessarily be speaking in my capacity as spokesman for the pan-EDM collaboration. But I'm in the luxurious position today where all the important concepts have more or less already been introduced and therefore I can afford to pick and choose what is um, maybe most interesting for the specialists or most likely to generate further discussion for those who are not deeply in the experimental details of these efforts. So Panidium is an experiment which is at the moment managed by three primary partners and a number of smaller um, collaborators. So TUM was the initiator of the effort. The ILL hosts the experiment in the neutron source. And my group at Heidelberg, since I came here a little more than a year ago, has been involved um, in collaboration with TUM leading the project. So when I give a popular talk on this, I try to summarize everything in a cartoon. And all of you know this very well. But what's maybe interesting here is that in every separation of length scale, we can make a jump by the same number of orders of magnitude. And so if we start with, say, a 10 centimeter apple and zoom in by 14 orders of magnitude, then we have the scale of a one Fermi neutron. And if we zoom in again by 14 orders of magnitude, then we are exactly at the 10 to the minus 27 centimeters level, which when multiplied by the elementary charge is the sensitivity target for next generation neutron EDM measurements. And then if we zoom out from the apple, we end up about the size of the solar system when we expand by 14 orders of magnitude. And then unfortunately, the pattern breaks down to get to the size of the observable universe, we have to go 13 rather than 14. So we're off by one, but that's a nice way of encapsulating in a very um, high level intuitive way, the kind of experimental precision we're trying to achieve. And then to contextualize a bit what we actually do in experiments, um, I'd like to put up a few numbers. And so a more natural unit, which was already used in this workshop is not the E centimeter, but the E Fermi, the Fermi of course, being somehow the natural length scale of the neutron. And so that's a conversion factor of 10 to the 13, but we measure frequencies and the frequency scales that are relevant in these experiments span also many orders of magnitude. And so the experimental precision for the present generation is about 24 nanohertz. If we want an order of magnitude in dipole moment that corresponds to an order of magnitude in energy and therefore also in frequency. So we want to approach the single nanohertz level in upcoming experiments. And then let's compare this to some other things which are not necessarily commonly cast in frequency units, but an inverse day is a relatively large frequency in comparison, and that's a shift. It's not a systematic error, but it's something that we have to compensate for, or we'll get a wrong result by many orders of magnitude. And then 15 minutes is maybe the time scale for changing some parameters in an experiment or relevant to neutrons. It's about the beta decay lifetime. And so in frequency units, that's a millihertz. And then we have to measure magnetic fields with something which is typically either a nuclear magnetic moment or an electronic one. And those bring us respectively into the hertz and kilohertz frequency regimes. And then when experimentalists are talking about neutron EDMs and energy scales, we typically use this unit of nano electron volts. And so that's as far from an electron volt as a GeV, just in the other direction but it's also approximately the gravitational potential that you get from raising one atomic mass unit. So a neutron by one centimeter in Earth's gravity. And then when we talk about cold and ultra cold neutrons, there's a very easy rule of thumb for keeping these straight when you 
class them by velocity. You just have to count integer powers in the exponent. So ultra cold neutrons are more or less everything between zero and 10 meters per second. Very cold neutrons are from 10 to 100. Cold neutrons are from 100 to 1,000. And thermal neutrons, so if you take this velocity and make a KT of kinetic energy equal to 1 half mb squared, then you get two kilometers per second. And this is all very, very slow in comparison to the few hundreds of MeV that Philip was talking about for getting neutrons off of the spallation target. But in a thermal reactor moderator, this is what we start with to deliver neutrons to PAN-EDM. And so I'm going to roughly outline my exposition today and highlight three things. One, of course, is the PAN-EDM experiment itself, always bearing in mind that our goal is to follow this green arrow in this kind of phase space plot that I like very much to distinguish between precision and energy and searching for new physics. And then comagnetometry, which we've already heard a few times in an experimental context is a very powerful experimental tool, but it has some limitations. So we're going to discuss those. And then statistics being one of the main challenges of present generation experiments. But as we've seen in the history plots where the precision of the neutron EDM measurements seem to saturate, I would argue that saturation was mainly driven by the non-availability of higher statistics from ultra cold neutron sources. And so I'll give you some personal thoughts on how we might be able to do better. And so then just as a taste of what each of those things is, this is a beautiful CAD image of the pan-EDM experiment. So there's a large magnetically shielded room which houses the measurement cells. There's a whole compact but dense and complicated interface apparatus. And then there's an ultra cold neutron source inside of a lead shielding, which sits maybe 70 meters from a research reactor. And then all of the supporting infrastructure fits in a footprint of about 100 square meters. For the comagnetometry, you already know how to measure a neutron EDM. There's this very simple Hamiltonian that arises from the coupling of a spin to electric and magnetic fields in a simple non-relativistic situation. And if we align the fields either parallel or anti-parallel, then the frequency difference measured between those two configurations is proportional to the electric field, whereas the sum would be proportional to the magnetic field. And so we can separate the magnetic effects which live inside the standard model and conserve CP from the symmetry violating electric dipole moment. And co-magnetometry, what we would really like to do if we make a measurement for such a frequency measuring experiment with a trapped ensemble of spin polarized particles, we'd like to glue a small magnetometer, say onto each one of these red dots, which represents the species being measured. And then it follows it around and you really decorrelate everything which is magnetic physics from everything which is EDM physics. But of course, in practice, we can't do that. We have to choose a secondary species shown in blue dots, which shares to the greatest extent possible, the magnetic physics experienced by the primary species. And so then we'll dive a little bit more into detail later on um, the ways in which that equivalence can break down. And then finally, the statistics, again, at a very cartoonish level, I essentially here want to highlight that if we get neutrons from a source, be it a reactor or a spallation target that are moderated down to thermal energies, so a few tens of milli EV now, we have to then do an experiment with them and that's actually where the most recuperable statistic losses presently occur. Because we have to do this in two stages. We have to take those two kilometer per second neutrons, somehow catch or stop them, and then put them in a storage container. And it turns out we're both very bad at catching neutrons and very bad at transferring them into storage bottles. And so roughly the proposal that I would make and I would argue that PAN-EDM is a first conceptual step in this direction is to eliminate both of those steps and do the catching and storage directly in situ. And Kent has already presented to you on the first day of the workshop, a sort of one cell version of this where the ultra cold neutrons in the SNS EDM effort are produced directly in liquid helium. And that's where the EDM measurement also takes place. This is obviously more challenging, but I hope I'll be able to convince you that it's worth it. So. This is where the neutrons come from for panidium. The small cylindrical blue building in the center is the Institut La Langevin, the research reactor in Grenoble, this beautiful mountainous region in France. 
And if you go to the reactor level and look down into the water moderator, you will see Cherenkov radiation with your naked eye. And so this is a unique and wonderful place to work. Um, and if you zoom in from above and look down at it and then outline the floor plan of neutron distribution in the guide holes, you come up with an overlay, something like this. And so now while well, the specialists and people who care are scrutinizing the most up-to-date reactor planning that has been recently announced by the Institute, it would be a shame not to profit from the scientific communication office of the ILL, which makes beautiful animations among other things. So here you can see neutrons of all colors and thus all energies being moderated and delivered out into a neutron guide. Now they get filtered. So most of the colors will disappear and only the green are coming off and these go down a secondary guide. They go into some experiment where they interact with a sample. They're then analyzed. So maybe some energy and momentum resolution and detected by ionizing charge in neutral gas, which is collected and transferred to a data acquisition system. And of course the data acquisition system should show you something as beautifully perfect as the sample, which is how you know this is an idealization and nothing real. We are different in the EDM community from the vast majority of what takes place at the ILL because the neutron itself is our sample. And so with that in mind, the neutron distribution follows the same general principles as the other 90%, but that is more or less where we depart from the conventional neutron scattering community. And a couple of elements which are relevant and which I would argue are the main reason why we can't easily save statistics earlier in the chain from the reactor to the experiment are this octagon guide and the circular one that stand among many possible instantiations of plumbing to get neutrons from a reactor into an experiment. But these ones are for super sun and they were optimized to within an inch of their lives, but we still lose that factor of 10 to the three that I was pointing to on the cartoon a few slides ago. And so bear in mind that with the most up-to-date neutron delivery systems that we can get, and this may improve a bit at the ESS or other new neutron sources, but not by orders of magnitude, um, we're still fundamentally limited by statistics. And so what does pan do with these neutrons when we arrive? Well, more or less the same thing as the other experiments which have been described. So even the beam EDM is doing a differential measurement between two sample volumes where the electric field points in opposite directions, but there's a common magnetic field. Here, like the SNS and Los Alamos and PSI experiments, we're also storing ultra-cold neutrons. So the neutrons are confined in these two storage cells, and we do a time-correlated Ramsey measurement on both of them. And we put a lot of magnetometers around to make sure that any drifts or fluctuations in the magnetic environment don't cause a false effect that we would mistake for an electric dipole moment. Now, statistics may be a challenge, but as anyone working in the field knows, the real meat of the experiment and the place where all of the effort goes in the end is in constraining systematic errors. And this is essentially the purpose of the magnetometers, but also of everything around them and really what we expect the bulk of the data taking to be oriented towards. And so for this, we need mercury magnetometers with a resolution of a few femtotesla, cesium magnetometers, which also float at high voltage, as you can see in the center of the cell stack. But these only give us the lever arm that we need if they're operating in a superbly good magnetic shield, which at millihertz frequencies has a shielding factor of nearly 10 to the seven. And so this is to be compared with a few hundred thousand that are more common for uh, existing magnetic shielded rooms. And this is one of the reasons that we think we can relax some of the requirements on the magnetometry. You'll notice, for example, that in this diagram, there is no co-magnetometer. There's no mercury sitting inside the cell with the neutrons. Um, but otherwise, we're more or less following the general pattern. So we simultaneously detect both spin states after an experimental cycle, 
we have broken our approach into two phases, which was mainly driven by time delays in delivering the SuperSun UCN source within the ILL's upgrade program to its instrument suite. But uh, for phase one, we think this is good enough to operate without a co-magnetometer. And we have in addition, or we expect, I have to admit we don't have it yet, but within the next six months that will hopefully change, a very soft spectrum of unpolarized ultra cold neutrons, which both uh, favors a long storage time in the cells and therefore an improved statistical reach, but also a reduction in all systematic errors that correlate with large neutron velocities. And so we're in the middle of commissioning everything, the major parts exist, but uh, the source will only deliver its first neutrons toward the end of this year or early next year. And those in the audience who've heard me say that now for several years may be hiding a smile, but uh, what can I tell you? The reactor cycles come when they come. Um, the sensitivity equation is the same as in general for account rate limited frequency measurements uh, operating on two cells with a fixed electric field and as long as possible, a holding time and as large as possible, a number of counted particles. But basically this is just Heisenberg uncertainty for measuring a frequency. So the longer you can measure and the better the counting statistics, which we assume to be Poisson, the more precisely we can know the frequency. And so the per run sensitivity is then just extrapolated into days and hundreds of days of running time by the duty factor and the accumulated statistics. Everything which is relevant for the statistical single shot sensitivity has already happened after five minutes or so. And then we have to check all parity switches to be sure that systematic effects are under control and accumulate repeated runs until we reach some predefined sensitivity target. But what I want to highlight here is that between the ultra cold neutron density and volume in situ in the source when the neutrons are produced at the end of a beam guide, and what is delivered at the beginning of a Ramsey cycle into the measurement cells, we are missing two orders of magnitude. And this is about two orders of magnitude, whether we talk about total number or neutron density. And in both cases, that's a nearly insufferable loss because after it's taken place, we can't afford to give up even a factor of two on anything else. And I think this illustrates better than uh, any, anything else I can point to why statistics is the limitation in these experiments. It's not actually that we can't produce high densities of ultra cold neutrons, but we have a very hard time in practice using them in experiments. And I'll first tell you how we do use them in experiments or how we intend to, and then tell you how I think we can do better in the future. But now a CAD model rather than a cartoon of the chamber stack and the green vacuum chamber surrounding it. So this is the same type of glass fiber as Tito was describing in his talk. We also have to wait a long time for it to pump down. The isolation vacuum inside the chamber is also decoupled from the vacuum inside the experimental cells and neutron guides. There's an apparatus to deliver approximately 200 kilovolts of high voltage to the central electrode. It can be either positively or negatively charged and thus we can invert the sense of the electric field in both cells simultaneously. And one of the concerns that we have to worry about highlighted here in this red line would be if there is a leakage current flowing from the high voltage electrode to one or other of the ground electrodes in a twisting path that would generate a magnetic field whose direction now obviously correlates with the polarity of the applied high voltage and therefore the linear frequency shift arising from such a leakage current mimics an electric dipole moment. If we look at a 3D view now instead of the cut, this is everything between the UCN source and the experiment in the heart of the magnetic shield, which was hidden by infrastructure in the zoomed out CAD view. And so on a one meter scale, we have guides that extend to about three or four meters between the source and the experiment. And this is intended to be as close as possible and as small as possible a volume to favor efficient UCN transport from source into experiment. The detectors, two for each cell, count spin up and spin down independently, so four in total. 
and each one has a polarizer and a spin flipper in front of it so that we can decide which detector sees which spin state in order to check all systematic effects by periodically inverting which detector is measuring what. And then I won't run through the entire recipe for doing a Ramsey experiment, but it's here if you want to scrutinize it. It takes about 400 seconds of which 250 seconds are anticipated to be the holding time during which the spins coherently evolve in the presence of the electric and magnetic fields. And this is timed in a kind of non-obvious compromise in order that during the Ramsey cycle, the source has a chance to build up a new population of ultra cold neutrons that can then be delivered into the experiment for the subsequent cycle. And this is a particularity of superfluid helium based ultra cold neutron sources, which does not apply, or at least does not apply to the same extent or in the same way to the deuterium based sources that were discussed by Tito and Philip and have been kind of the standard in the field for um, the most recent measurements. So we have not only a complicated situation because we have to deliver neutrons out of helium, but in fact, the entire experiment was recommissioned to be possible at all at the ILL. It was originally designed for a deuterium-based source at Munich, which has unfortunately failed to materialize. And therefore, a lot of what I'm showing you has been painstakingly retrofit and redesigned and re-simulated over the last years. But now it is sitting nearly complete at the ILL and essentially waiting for the neutrons to come. So the magnetic shield, which I mentioned, is um, maybe our greatest asset overall. So this is, I think, not even the best or most recent data, but you can see cuts through the three planes in the central uh, one half meter cubed or so. And um, at one point, I don't know if this is still true, but when it was initially measured with something like 250 picotesla peak to peak over that volume, this was the most magnetically homogeneous region of space on that scale that was believed to exist in the solar system. And this means that a lot of um, effects related to external magnetic fields propagating into the experiment can be ignored to an extent, which is not necessarily possible elsewhere. Um, we don't plan at the moment to use active compensation, but that would certainly, as you can see from the figure in the center for the Berlin magnetic shielded room that was mentioned a few times by others, um, active compensation certainly does make a big difference at low frequencies when it is carefully done. Um, if we take now a cut view through the CAD model of the shields themselves, then this is what you see. So there's an outer room, which is about three meters cubed with two layers of mu metal and then a removable insert, which has three more layers with an intermediary RF shield uh, attached to the outer room. And then there's an additional cylinder directly around the vacuum chamber in the center. So the little red rectangles and the green vacuum chamber around them are exactly what we were looking at a few slides ago, now embedded in their proper environment. And if you look at it from outside or did last year, then you would see something like this, where we're now looking from the left end on the left toward the closed door. Um, so this is really a room and it has a clean room attached to it on the left-hand side whose purpose is something of a hybrid between an instrumentation cabin and a housing facility for all of the magnetometers and other things that have to run very stably to confirm that the magnetic conditions inside the shield are in fact as stable as we want them to be. And then behind it where you can't really see it all but there'll be another view in a moment is the source of ultra cold neutrons and the neutrons from the reactor enter from right to left in the horizontal. So if we look at the vacuum chamber actually implanted inside the magnetic shield, then it looks like this. And then you can see at the end of the back wall, several compensation coils, which exist as tunable degrees of freedom in order to optimize the residual fields after the shields have been equilibrated in the running condition. One of our challenges at the moment is to converge on a recipe for optimizing 
their use and practice that converges in a realistic running time. So we never actually used all of the degrees of freedom that are available to us. And we still got very good results for residual fields and gradients, but in principle, we can do better and we're more or less limited by not knowing how to explore that parameter space efficiently enough. Um, now the view in the other direction with the insert pulled back, you can see the coil which makes the bias field around the vacuum chamber and a corresponding set of correction coils on the other end. So this is a little bit laborious to open the shields in such a way, but it's an operation of an hour or two. And for the scale of what's being done, it's actually not so bad. And that's important in order to be able to access and maintain the innermost parts of the experiment. So here's that view again, and now you can put it all together, except perhaps for the ultra cold neutron source, which will be the subject of the next 15 minutes or so. Um, I will give you a brief overview on this entire interface business in a couple of slides, but I won't discuss it in any detail. Please feel free to ask about things, but there's just too much and too many moving parts. So I'm, I'm going to follow my stated philosophy of highlighting the things I think are interesting. Um, if we take a cut view through everything, then you can see that this interface business is actually uh, relatively small compared to the scale of the magnetic shields and even the experiment itself. The only feature I want to point to here is this uh, polarizing coil at the right, so the first neutron optics element after the source. And we can do this with a room temperature polarizing coil because the spectrum of UCN energy is coming out of the source is so low that with about two Tesla of magnetic field, they don't have the kinetic energy to penetrate that barrier. Uh, well, the low field seeking spins don't, the high field seeking spins do. And so they come through as polarized ultra cold neutrons that are then filled into the experiment. This will disappear or function only as a cleanup polarizer in the phase two for which it is foreseen to operate the source in a mode where it intrinsically generates polarized ultra cold neutrons. So that's another novelty, but one which is a little bit farther on the horizon of future developments. And then if we look from top so that you can see the UCN source, you can actually go and pull this image out of a three-dimensional virtual tour of the ILL and wander around the guide halls and spin the point of view panoramically and you'll, you'll find this orientation among others, but this shows the magnetic shields and the open configuration, as well as the three meter cryostat in which ultra cold neutrons are produced and the cooling tower and some supporting pumps and electronics infrastructure, and then the clean room behind everything. So this is what it looks like beginning of last summer when the lead shielding was dismounted the cryostats are now in the process of being brought back after some extensive testing following a series of underperforming um, nuisances that were subsequently resolved and therefore I won't dwell on, but we're, we're hoping to see something like this again within the next few months, remount the shielding and again, hopefully produce ultra cold neutrons by the end of the year. This is what the interface looks like if we break it out in components and I show you a couple of photographs or CAD models of different pieces. We need rotating switches to redirect neutrons to flow either into the experiment or at the end of a Ramsey cycle then into the detectors rather than back into the source. Um, we need these Y pieces and spin flippers and so forth to detect them at the end and the principle of simultaneous spin detection basically assumes that uh, wrong spin neutron to pass the polarizer, thus a low field seeker will have a chance to bounce into the other path, get its spin flipped by the corresponding spin flipper, and then be counted by the complementary detector. And thus, as in all modern designs, we don't throw away the statistics of the second spin state. So the one thing I want to highlight here before moving on are the cesium magnetometers. 
And this was a long development, which actually rather recently converged on a result of which I think we can be justifiably proud. Um, the technology itself is nothing intrinsically new. So these are optically pumped warm vapor magnetometers based on Faraday rotation of linearly polarized light in a room temperature gas cell. But it was always challenging to have these operate in a mode that was compatible with the time scale of a neutron EDM measurement. So as you've heard, a neutron EDM measurement might last a couple of hundred seconds. And for neutron spins, that's fine. But for electronic spins in cesium atoms, it's a bit long. And so with one or two standout exceptions that could never really be fully explained, it was not systematically possible to make integrating measurements over such a time scale that led to a useful field sensitivity for neutron EDM systematics. And we've recently changed that. So these are essentially in-house in designed and constructed sensors with fully non-magnetic heads. And we were able to run several of them simultaneously in the shielded room in Berlin and observe that between integration times of 70 and 600 seconds, more or less, the stability uh, was, sorry, the sensitivity was stable below 50 femtotesla. And this is long enough that it's not only relevant and practically ideal for the next measurements that we want to do, but these very long integration times would even still be compatible if we succeed in developing neutron storage cells that preserve the neutrons and their spin polarization for longer than these few hundred seconds that have now been the state of the art for some time. And I'll show you in a few more slides that there's actually some hope that could happen. Um, now we need more of these than we have at the moment, but we've succeeded in getting about four of them working and that's enough that we're confident to be able to continue scaling up and not only can they be run in this fiberized mode but for the one which if i just jump back to the cartoon sits here inside the central high voltage electrode this can be decoupled and so the laser beams propagate in free space so that operation mode has also been tested now moving from magnetometry to neutron technology um, I've, I've told you that helium-based UCN sources, so the, the principles that Kent was describing for SNS, have been constructed and used in the past, but are not really standard user facilities. Fortunately, at the ILL, we have a, a long tradition that's involved some of the other people at this workshop in developing those sources. And so we have those prototypes available still for R&D work. And I think this is a really beautiful example of incremental developments with students that actually lead to very consequential possibilities for the large experiment. So in, from roughly 2017 to 2018, I had a master's student who was a very good mechanical engineer, and he developed this small test cryostat, which was then handed off to uh, Tom Neulinger, who at that time was a beginning PhD student, and over a few years of incremental work, we were able to consolidate this into a rather nice and reliably running platform where every time we had a new idea on something to try for ultra cold neutron storage, we could plug in a modular test volume and just see how it worked. And so that lowered the threshold to trying new things that might be a little bit more risky. And okay, a lot of them didn't lead anywhere. But recently, some of them did. And that is why we believe today that it might be possible to hold the neutrons in the storage cells for longer than we were able to do before. And also why we can envision improved sources for these in situ experiments that would also take advantage of long storage times. So what was done here was essentially to take uh, this material. It's a commercial fluoropolymer. It's called Cytop, but it's basically a fully perfluorinated uh, chain. It's as if you would have fumblin grease or um, in a solid form. And then to coat a closed volume, hold neutrons in it and see what's the one over E decay time 
for neutron storage. And at room temperature, this is already something on the order of 310 seconds. So that's not bad. I, I should say these are unpolarized measurements. So th this is still in the development chain. But then when we go down to cryogenic temperatures, which are relevant for neutron source developments, it gets almost a factor of two better. And let's remember that 560 seconds is coming a lot closer to the 880 second fundamental limit of beta decay than um, anything else we had available up to now. And we didn't only do storage measurements, but we essentially have done a complete material characterization. So by cold neutron reflectometry, you can measure the height of the potential barrier on the wall of a storage vessel. And then the storage measurements tell you the probability for neutron loss at each wall interaction. And so now with some error bars, we have a pretty good idea of what this material can offer us in any application. And it turns out it's one of the better ones that we have seen in general. Okay, turning now to co-magnetometry, or maybe I can invite questions on anything up to this point. So about two thirds of the way through the time and two thirds of the way through the slides, but I'm dancing between things I think are interesting and therefore like to offer the opportunity for people to interrupt and ask questions about them. Yeah, please. I'm from uh, completely, you know, um, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I yeah. try to understand what's the complementarity of this experiment, for example, with the N2DM, N2DM, for example. Is that because I've seen, I've seen cesium there and here, I've seen the, the way you do the command algorithms. I don't know, it looks similar, so I would like to understand what, what kind of. Oh, it's, I, that's correct. It, it is very similar. I mean, basically, these experiments are trying to do the same thing, and we've converged on a lot of the same solutions. Um, in fact, because those two particular experiments had a common origin in the first place, but also because um, when, when you need the best performance for measuring a certain magnetic field strength and a certain bandwidth, um, you end up in the same place. So for if, if I really want to say what is complementary, um, we're, we're going to dive into experimental detail. So it's, it's a neutron EDM experiment with two cells and ultra cold neutron storage, whether, whether PSI delivers the number or we do, it will tell you something similar. We'll have different systematic errors. Um, we're using a different type of UCN source. I would, I would argue that the type of UCN source we're using has more potential for further improvements by more orders of magnitude in the future, but that's highly debatable as long as you haven't delivered the next order of magnitude yet. Um, and so in, in that sense, the main difference is that we're exploring a complementary path in some of these technical developments. Um, they're, they're long, slow experiments, and we can't afford to wait until the present ones are done before trying out some things that might or might not deliver a long lever arm in the generation after. Yeah. Sure. So. Uh, yeah. One, one second. Yeah. To yeah. So. Right. By all means. Can you? Uh, Do you hear me? Yeah. 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 Hey. Uh, 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 I'm about the accuracy of the season. Do we have a number for that? I, in, uh, you know how? You mean in terms of offsets from each other? Well, um, absolute accuracy, yes. As, as you use them um, as, as this, um, local so, um, sensors um, at several positions, you will not be able to measure with the same sensor at all the positions, the same field. So it's essential That's to correct. have an absolute accurate magnetometer for that purpose. Yes, so for this, we rely on the mercury. You don't see the same fast bandwidth. So but... then, then you only check whether the field is stable with that? So you have no spatial resolution? No, I mean, we, we have spatial resolution, but you, you don't control these. I mean, the, the offsets are, are no longer micro Tesla like they were when we first built these sensors, but they're, they're not good enough for an absolute field measurement. Um, you, you can see if something is fluctuating. So if we would have 
a discharge or a leakage transient that we don't see otherwise, then this is the path to constrain it. The, the mercury, of course, is integrating over a long time and you will know in absolute terms if something happened, but you can't necessarily pinpoint when it was. And that, that was the second question. Um, um, mm -hmm. um, for, could you comment on, on how the mercury cell actually looks like? Is that the yeah, pancake of or is that, is that a cylinder? No, no, so here, um, we were just getting to that. So I'll skip ahead. Here's a oh, picture. Sorry. Uh, no, no problem. It's, it's the perfect question. So of course, um, the mercury cell is a cylinder and it's chosen with a volume and aspect ratio such that the polarization lifetime in the cell roughly matches the 250 seconds that we anticipate for the UCNs. And then we essentially build this gradiometer stack, which has a relatively long baseline across the neutron cells and the high voltage electrode. And we need that to be good to about four femtotesla mm. in order to hit our, our phase one systematics. And maybe if you permit the last question, you, you showed yeah, of course. These, these shielding factors. And, and in the beginning, you stated that your shielding factor is uh, suddenly 10 to the seven. And yes. when you go to this plot, um, maybe I, uh, yeah. I misread so, it. But it look, no, no, the, the plot, pencil, but you showed us. <laughs> The plot was to make a different point about the, the active compensation here. Um, this shielding factor is only for the outer two layers. Oh, that's only the outer two yeah. layers because you're okay then, yeah. Yeah, at this time, the insert was not yet delivered. Bernard, you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, hi, Skyla. The please uh, go ahead. Uh, so uh, one thing we fight constantly, you didn't mention at all yet is uh, magnetic impurities. So yes. Uh, you know, you know, your shielding factor doesn't shield against what you put inside. And Absolutely not. <laughs> so how do you know? What do you have? How, how are you going to do that? And also, I mean, you have no core magnometry. So if you have something, you know, which uh, goes goes up and down with your e field, yep. so you don't see it. So what, what's your That's, strategy there? So the, those are also perfect questions. For the first one, um, I think I have a picture here, which is relevant. Uh, we have to screen stuff like everything else. I think you asked the question to Tito as well, and we're in a much much more luxurious situation than he is because we can screen things anywhere there is a magnetically shielded room and a squid. And that is available in three places in our collaboration. So we have the MSR at ILL. Uh, we can always go to Berlin as we've done in the past. And since September last year, we also have a new magnetically shielded facility at Heidelberg, whose primary purpose in life is to measure the xenon electric dipole moment, but it has a 300,000 shielding factor in a squid system. So it's perfectly good for checking things as well. And we have to run five kilometers of cable, just like everyone else. Um, I, if, if you ever find a way around that, please tell me. Um, and then, your second question is the one that still keeps me up at night because if there is a little dipole sitting inside the cell, which flips maybe 10% of the time is correlated with high voltage, we'll eventually see it at the 10 to the minus 27 level through the mercury, but not until we've collected our entire data set and therefore it's already too late. So this is maybe the biggest risk and I can't, give you a very satisfying answer at the moment for how to exclude it completely. We have to see if our four pi magnetometry coverage and our sensor bandwidth and stability are good enough in the running configuration. And so at the moment, our global gradients are about a nanotesla per meter. If we can push that down to 100 or 300 picotesla per meter, then we'll be in a much more comfortable situation as far as that goes. But that would require the final optimization of these remaining correction coils that I mentioned before that are foreseen, but for which we don't yet have the perfect recipe on how to implement them. Um, but you, yes, you have put your finger on the main principal disadvantage of avoiding the co-magnetometer here. And I won't present otherwise. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, may yeah. I have one other? You did, of course. You, did, you did, didn't see anything on the on your electrodes. What's the status? Yeah, what's the coding? yeah? That's right. So here, I'll show you a picture of them. Um, this is one of the electrodes. It is coated with diamond-like carbon, and we spent a while both finding a supplier who would coat something this large, 
and developing a special process where the neutron optical potential would be high enough. Um, so that took a while and we ended up doing these in a way that this central part is an insert in a larger diameter mechanical mounting around the outside. And so it's also in principle exchangeable. Um, this is going together with a standard quartz ring or so, but um, apart from that, the only subtlety is the, the DLC coating recipe. Um, it's a polished aluminum substrate. Nice. Did you measure the, the, the potential of the DLC? We did. So we've done that by neutron reflectometry um, in the same way as I showed for Cytop like this. And uh, this was what led us to the development because it was only about 100 nano EV when we took the off the shelf option from the company that would coat on these dimensions. And in the end, we had to get them to switch to a deuterated precursor. They were using a certain organic solvent that was apparently loading a lot of hydrogen into the DLC. And then it jumped to um, above 200, maybe 203, 204, something like that in the end. Um, and I, I didn't show it, but we've we've done the same series of uh, storage measurements across temperature ranges in this test facility exactly for those coatings. And they're actually quite comparable to the CYTOP. The loss factor is a bit higher, but we can still get three to 400 second storage times. And I should say these are in small cells. So yeah. this is in a, a four liter cell, which is only eight centimeters across. Okay, thank so you. We, yeah, of course. I think that's good. Yeah. Cool. If there are no other questions, then I will say why in principle, I think comagnetometry is not necessarily the best idea going forward. So to illustrate that, I'm going to take the example of the xenon electric dipole moment search with which we used a helium-3 comagnetometer. So helium-3 already showed up as a comagnetometer option in the SNS experiment and xenon-129 has a nucleus that looks a lot like a neutron in the sense that there is one valence neutron and up to semi-leptonic um, for Fermi interactions, uh, it actually looks rather the same in effective field theory as well. But due to a strong scaling with atomic number, um, so z to the three or z to the four, the EDM is much more enhanced in xenon than in helium-3. And the idea of a comagnetometer measurement is that we take this difference frequency where the measured xenon spin precession has the weighted helium spin precession frequency subtracted off of it. And then you can think of this experiment as measuring the difference between the xenon and the helium electric dipole moments where we assume that the helium EDM is small enough that we can ignore it and so then this mainly has the function of correcting for magnetic field drifts and, uh, and any systematic effect that the helium also sees. But the problem is that when you actually write out everything which can be different between the primary and secondary species, so here between the helium and the xenon, but for the neutron, for example, between the neutron and mercury, um, there's a lot of possibility. And Comagnetometry works very well when all of these residual corrections are small in comparison to the error bar that you hope to establish. But as we go to increasingly precise experiments, then you run into the situation where these things that you're subtracting off become larger and larger in comparison to the bound that you want to set. And this is already the case in the neutron EDM experiment and in the helium and xenon experiments. So the main systematic problems come in some sense from the comagnetometer because the magnetic field gradients are sampled differently by the different spatial distributions of atoms and neutrons. In the case of helium and xenon, this is a small effect because gases at room temperature have a relatively uniform distribution across a small storage cell. And so that's not the term that matters. But for the neutron and mercury, the neutron may have an effective temperature of say five millikelvin, whereas the mercury is sitting at room temperature. 
And this leads to a very different density distribution. And so this delta P, delta B minus delta B is not something you can ignore anymore. And by the way, it's not a systematic error, but here's the Earth's rotation again. So we're subtracting off something weighted by the same ratio, which is 11 microhertz, when what we hope to isolate in the first term is maybe a few nanohertz. And then everything else can happen as well. There are pressure dependent uh, chemical shifts in the co-magnetometer and you can find all kinds of species dependent shifts, which are not necessarily due to different spatial distributions, but due to the different interactions of atoms which have different structure or of an atom which has a different structure than a neutron. And so I, I contend that while co-magnetometry is a very elegant and powerful idea, um, we're, we're entering a regime of precision where it amounts to trying to measure the height of grass on top of a skyscraper. And the height of the skyscraper is something you would rather not have to factor in and subtract away because this is a significant opportunity to get things wrong. I mean, this was a problem in neutron lifetime measurements for many years as well, where the measured values had to be extrapolated into a non-accessible region of parameter space where the losses vanish. And only when the experiments actually succeeded in eliminating those losses in the real world, did one have true confidence in the results. And I, I think we will find a similar situation here. But just to illustrate what this can look like, this is a different regime than matters for the neutrons, but it's the one that I was discussing with Kent uh, earlier this week. If you have a relatively high density, so um, hundreds of millibars close to an atmosphere inside a small cell of both spin polarized xenon and spin polarized helium, then these magnetizations will couple to each other. And we can do a very precise frequency measurement. You see data on the right-hand side, the peaks are very well localized and the noise level is actually quite good, but it's actually these peaks which are in some sense coupling to each other. And we see large modulations now of millihertz from rotating the cell because the small amount of gas which sits in the non-symmetrical stem attached on the spherical cell is acting back on the gas in the sphere. And in principle, you have something like this anytime you put spin polarized objects in a non-spherical volume. Um, and this fits very well, both on repeated measurements and to uh, essentially um, a Legendre oscillation that you can fit and, and check the shape shift that you would expect. And then by inverting one polarization or another, you can affect the helium, say, by flipping the helium, you generate a shift in the helium frequency, but also by flipping the xenon, you generate a shift in the helium frequency. And these are, again, large shifts. So this is all coming from a direct spin-spin coupling, um, which is, if you like, the species-dependent term here. For the neutron EDM, again, it's mainly at the moment the different volume averaging, which is relevant. But the point I want to make is that there's a lot going on here and it can't just be in general constrained. Okay, so I have showed you all of these things and I'll talk briefly now about the statistics aspect. So this third thing I want to highlight in the context of ultra cold neutron production in superfluid helium. So this is the dispersion curve, which is used to produce ultra cold neutrons by inelastic scattering in superfluid helium. And the advantage of superfluid helium-4 is it's the only material we have that doesn't absorb neutrons. And so you can build up a large density over time. And the time scale of a thousand seconds is not an accident. That's roughly about the best that you can do up to beta decay. Here, the time constant is actually only a few hundred seconds. So there's still something to gain. But what you see in the buildup curve here is a little bit of leakage out of the source as it's saturating after the beam turns on. And then the neutrons are released to a detector. And so the integral of this peak is what you have available for counting statistics in an experiment. And the figure of merit is not totally obvious to write down, but it's proportional to the differential flux of cold neutrons. And then you have to weight something by an exponential attenuation as the neutrons are propagating through liquid helium because they also scatter by other processes. So the mean free path is about 10 meters, but 
the sources of the present day are restricted to three meters or so. And so this means that you lose a factor of 10, 90% of the neutrons, which would be useful for producing UCN are just going out the other side of a three meter source into a beam stop. And then when you combine that with a factor of 100 for the transport losses that we discussed before, this is the factor of 1000 overall loss. And so out of every thousand neutrons that we could in principle be using, we're wasting on, on average about 999 of them. So SuperSun has attempted to optimize around the problems of neutron delivery and storage of the ultra cold neutrons that are produced. So it's a large cryo system about three meters in length holding several liters of superfluid helium at a temperature around 0 0.6 Kelvin. And we don't want to lose any of the cold neutrons that come in from the right-hand side. So there's actually a neutron guide sitting under the superfluid helium. And then this complicated looking box on the left is what provides a means of extracting the neutrons out to an experiment. So that's where we lose the factor of 100. And then the beam stop over here is where we lose the factor of 10 but we want to do a very good job of keeping the ultra cold neutrons which are produced inside the source. And to do that in phase two, there will be an octopole superconducting magnet added to produce a magnetic potential to prevent the neutrons from interacting with the walls and being absorbed. So this is the major conceptual difference to existing sources and probably the one with the most potential to be further extended in the future. So by the way, um, I will skip this for a moment because I want to show you that the prototype source, the same one which was used for measuring materials uh, for research and development has actually delivered the, I, I don't want to call it a world record, but a, a very high in situ ultra cold neutron density. So 220 ultra cold neutrons per cubic centimeter is to be contrasted with one or two that might be typical during an actual electric dipole moment measurement. And so the factor of 100 is bringing you exactly down to this by taking the neutrons out of the source. So once we've made these neutrons in super sun, we want to be very careful not to lose them. That's where we can't afford any more factors of two. Um, and so we have to do very detailed studies of the loss probabilities for neutrons interacting on material walls. And in the interest of time, I won't discuss this in detail, but maybe people have already exhausted their questions. We can come back to it later, but basically the losses at finite energy can be strongly suppressed by a judicious choice of materials. And then here on this slide, you just see how we go from the highest available thermal flux in the world right now. So 10 to the 15 neutrons per square centimeter in second in a cold source, so now moderated down to 22 Kelvin, and then distributed to an end of a guide, we still have 10 to the 10 in the same units, but we throw away those 10 orders of magnitude very quickly in making ultra cold neutrons. And the reason for this is basically that the production cross-section is just intrinsically small. That's what nature gave us. There's not much we can do about it. So our options for improvement are either to preserve these neutrons once we have them, or to start with a higher flux in order to leverage um, the same cross-section. And so now this means that the number that goes in the square root at the end of the sensitivity estimation, of course, depends on a density and a cell volume, but this has to be extrapolated by dilution from what's produced in the source. And this contains the volumes of the guide, the source, and the experimental cell. So this is a conceptual difference between a liquid helium-based source like we have that delivers high densities versus basically every other source technology which delivers a high flux of ultra cold neutrons. And since a density is what matters if you must measure an EDM in a very well controlled and understood finite size experimental environment, I would argue that this is the direction to continue pushing for further gains in the future. And so now after getting those neutrons, we have to suppress all of the lost channels and you can write 
a sum of partial rates to schematically illustrate that. But I will simply continue and show you the spectral difference that I highlighted before. So coming from um, a more conventional ultra cold neutron source, we're really filling this velocity band between zero and 10 meters per second that I introduced in the first place. From the helium source, the axial velocity is much, much closer to zero on average. So this is good for systematics, but it also makes the neutrons hard to transport. And then my, my final words before finishing will be on how to do something different from SuperSun by essentially combining the EDM technology with the source technology. And this would be a scenario where the electric field cells for Ramsey cycles are embedded in the liquid helium environment of the cryostat. This has a number of advantages, not the least of which is to use the high in situ densities produced directly in the helium, but you also reach high electric field strengths in liquid helium, which maybe Tito mentioned, but this is actually approaching the values that Florian also quoted for the beam EDM. We can tolerate the insulator rings, the dielectric strength of helium gains about a factor of three. And we can afford also to have smaller cell dimensions, which is also favorable for systematics um, because the density is higher. And so a, a lot of things go in the good direction at the obvious cost that the complexity of the apparatus is significantly increased. And so the challenge then is to do this in a kind of modular and scalable way so as to not commit too much on the high risk approach to improved statistics um, when to be perfectly honest, the situation with respect to systematics is not really clear. Um, but you need the statistics in order to do systematic studies. And as far as I know, this is the only such concept that would even conceivably deliver the statistics for a 10 to the minus 29 e centimeter statistical precision. Systematics, again, are completely another story. But we have to develop some in situ neutron detectors to do that. This is something which is being actively pursued now at Heidelberg and with collaborators in Munich and Budapest. Um, there are a number of different ways it could be done. We could borrow the approach of SNS to detect scintillation photons in the liquid helium from charged particles resulting either from neutron decay or neutron capture. But I think one of the interesting ideas is to borrow something that would live under the heading of quantum sensing and use the interaction of neutrons with magnetic fields to turn a detector on and off in a way that gives both sensitivity to different energy bands and selectivity to the spin state because then the low field seekers will be turned around and the high field seekers will penetrate and be counted. But I'm going through this very fast in order to keep to an hour or so in total. Um, this is some data that we collected um, just as a very basic proof of the principle. And then I'll just recapitulate to say that PAN-EDM is moving forward. We hope to see the first ultra cold neutron soon. Comagnetometry is hard. We already knew that, but it's not necessarily the best idea. And there are some ways that we could improve the statistics, but um, this is all a challenge and it's all ongoing. So I'll shamelessly advertise that we're looking for students and postdocs. Uh, please contact me or anyone in the collaboration if you have any questions. And if you have immediate questions on the content of the talk or anything that I didn't mention, but maybe you think I should have, please don't hesitate. Now would be the time. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Scarry, for a very interesting presentation. Questions here or from Zoom? Oh, oh there is a question there, Kent. Oh, it's clapping. Oh, that was, oh, it's that clapping. was more of a hang <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's more of a hang clap. But, yeah. Um, I mean, sure. maybe more of a comment. Than... Oh, well, OK. Let's... Yeah, go ahead. What's up, maybe, Kent? Yeah, can I... you comment? I comment, too. Okay, well, my comment on the skyscraper, was it skyscraper looking at a blade of technology? <laughs> yeah. That the sky, well, the skyscraper is still there, but if you choose, if you kept your eyes to the, you know, the top of the sky, you know, to view, your view of the skyscraper, 
Uh, does that mean it's gone? I don't know. Uh, if, if I'm going to continue to abuse this metaphor, I would say that we're now interested in measuring the height of grass at ground level rather than uh, putting the skyscraper there only to take it away again. Okay. <laughs> yes, as, as you as you spend most of the time to try to convince people that um, co-magnetometry is very dangerous and is a real risk to the experiment, I would like to comment on that. Um, as Please go ahead, yes. Yes, so um, the, the you, you try to compare or convince people by looking at an experiment where you work at very high pressures, where you have spin-dependent spin, spin systematics and where you um, have no second chamber, which is correcting. So both experiments at SNS as well as um, at PSI have a double chamber. So any shift you have is canceled. So what you put there is big problem, the earth rotation is canceled in any in single measurement. So what you actually gain is that you have, I don't know how to put that in the pictures of your skyscrapers, but that you correct it immediately and you have the full power of the co-magnetometer to show something which is going on really right next to your chamber, which all your co-magnetometry you propose is blind. And only the co-magnetometer permits you to, to see that channel. And so you prefer to close your eyes and hope everything goes fine and propose an experiment of 10 to the minus 29, where you don't even have a clue how you correct all these problems. And it's, I think it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, why, why don't you talk about your experiment instead of trying to convince people that co-magnetometer is such a bad thing? It, it's not. The next thing I would like to point out, both Kent in the SNS as well as we, we have methods where we go to a point where we don't have any systematics coming anymore from the um, emotional electric field effect. So, so that's not true. So, so I, I would ask you really um, not to look at these things in a perspective which is not ad adequate. Thank you. Okay, so th there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I, I'd maybe first point out that the first EDM experiment, which was measuring something on the level of 10 to the minus 30, was mercury, which also doesn't use a co-magnetometer. So I, I think it, it's a fair criticism that I, I shouldn't generalize in, in one direction, but I, I would equally warn you back that you shouldn't say a co-magnetometer is needed or that it really solves all problems perfectly because it doesn't. Um, well, what, what was the volume of the cell and the... And the uh, here here for yeah. helium xenon, it was similar to mercury. These are sort of one inch scale, yeah. but it's That's true that we only had one of them, but it's, it's not that you need co-magnetometry uh, and this goes hand in hand with multiple cells. That's simply not true. And then I, I don't, yeah, I, I certainly accept that this, this is not a fully quantitative argument for the view that I'm espousing. My, my intention was rather to illustrate that at a certain level of sensitivity, this becomes really complicated to do well. And, and you're right, the earth rotation is not the main part of the story. I, I put it there because I think this is something which is not necessarily obvious to people who are not working on these experiments that this is something we already have to take away. And, and we do it so well that most of the time, indeed, we can forget about it. But it's, it's not the case that a co-magnetometer just takes away all of your systematics. You, you can't say that. You have any number of higher order interactions. You have any number of systematics that weren't yet discovered even. And you, you can't a priori state that these are disappearing. Well, we have written a series of papers on the, on that. We, we, we have um, um, really published all the details of the co-magnetometry um, using mercury in the double chamber in, in the future with the magic field option. I'm familiar um, that, with it. That's all, all X out. It, it demonstrates very clearly that the capacities are absolutely there. So um, if, if you want to, to kind of attack that and make doubts that this is- No, no, Philip, Philip, my, my intention know, is not to attack to, anything. Yeah, but you do that. I, I don't know why, why you- No, 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 sorry. I'm, I, I, your talk 
on, on magnetometry and co-magnetometry, you don't want to use in your experiment. You, you don't want to use that. And you still spend a third of your talk on that subject. No, no, no. Let, let me clarify. I, I want to explain why we don't use it in phase one. For, for today, we don't have a solution for phase two without co-magnetometry. And in that sense, I agree with you. We, we don't know how to go in a room temperature storage experiment with UCN extraction to 10 to the minus 28 without co-magnetometry. I don't believe that's an argument that it can't be done, but we certainly don't know how to do it right now. The problem with the co-magnetometers are not even only these. I mean, you, you know very well, for example, that this is limiting the lifetime you can have for the ultra cold neutrons in the cell. It's limiting the high voltage you can apply. I mean, th these are things which matter in the statistic sensitivity of your experiment. And so I, I think it's worth asking the question if these are constraints which can be relaxed. I'm, I'm sorry if it came as an attack, that, that well, was not the you, intention. So, sorry, Skylar, but, but now you, you state two other things, that we limit our lifetime of the neutrons we have in our cells with using mercury and magnetometer. This is not true. We never saw any difference whether we have the mer mercury vapor at 10 to the minus seven millibar pressure in there or not. And you say we limit our high voltage capacity, which is also not true. We went to 200 kilovolts over the cell with, high uh, with mercury and we're running there overnight, over days. So, so why do you say- Over 100 days? Which, I mean- you, Did you, how many, how, how much, high, hundred, how many hundred kilovolts did you put on your cell yet? We, we haven't put cells in the final apparatus, Philip. I, I can't answer that. Yes, but don't say that we have problems with mercury, co magnetometry, with the high voltage. It's not true. No one has. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm misrepresenting something. My, my understanding was different. It's a pity we don't have the afternoon discussion. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there more questions or comments? Because otherwise, I will ask you, as I've done with all the experimentalists, the $100 million question um, <laughs> it increases every day so yeah do you have a timeline or we do but um this is notorious <laughs> sorry I, I didn't hear the comment from the audience oh, oh yeah no no it, it wasn't it wasn't important really yeah okay no i mean it's it's never been possible to reliably predict the time scale of this experiment um i i can show you Again, the reactor schedule, which has been limiting us up to now. Um, we are hoping that in one of these upcoming green boxes, when the reactor runs, everything on the source will be properly configured to begin commissioning the experiment. So then to deliver neutrons in the cells and check that the transport and, and storage are working. I think it would be overly optimistic to suppose that we're doing anything like useful Ramsey measurements much before the next long shutdown comes in yellow. And so then the, the earliest time that I could seriously envision data taking for an EDM results would be in end of 2024, beginning of 2025. But you see there's also a long shutdown sneaking up behind that. And so these, these schedules easily jump by a year. And unfortunately, that's already happened to us. Um, so yeah. to, to, to reach the sensitivity, for example, of the Los Alamos experiment, if I remember right, uh, there is a five years data taking with the 50% efficiency. Yeah, uh, right. To, so to get the sensitivity, what, what would be the corresponding numbers here, more or less? So here, it's not quite so bad. Los Alamos has to share beam time in a way that we do not. So when I say 100 days on the bottom line to reach this 4, 10 to the minus 27, that is two reactor cycles. So in, in principle, that can be within half a year. It's unlikely that we would actually collect that data really 24 seven with full duty factor in continuous blocks but it's a fully dedicated beam line. And as long as things are in good working order, we, we don't have to distribute our time over multiple years in, in the same way as Los Alamos. One, once things are ready, we're limited by the number of systematic studies that we have to do and how long that takes to understand and then analyze the data. So 
of course, once the data is there, it also takes some time. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. I mean, my sorry. comment is typically oh, yeah, sorry, people Ken, assume a duty factor of on the order of 20% to 30%. So, yeah. so. but I, you are more under time constraint if you know if you lose days during a reactor cycle, you don't. You, you yeah. Get, the, off, you know what I mean? So that's, that's, that's right. The, the reactor is on for 50 days, 24 seven, and then it might be off for six months. So it's, it's better to really run 216 cycles a day without pausing day in, day out, if you can. Uh, thanks a lot, Skyler. Are there yeah. any questions or comments? If not, I think it's got. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like oh. to yeah, apologize sorry. again if if anyone felt attacked by the comments on comagnetometry. That that was really not the intention. I, I was trying to illustrate, as I've had to do now many times in in recent years, why we've chosen to do it this way. It's it's not intended to be a, a dogmatic political statement. Oh, I think it's part of the scientific discussion. I would have asked the questions: Why you don't use it? Why everybody else uses it? In any case, as a you know. As Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay, right. thanks. Thanks, Carla, again. Yeah, thank and you again.